Who loves traffic? Nobody? No, but you like traffic? Well, good news is you're going to get a lot more traffic. And the reason you're going to get a lot more traffic is because what a lot of the speakers don't tell you, robots, no ro robots, is there are more cars on the road than ever, and more cars are coming to the road. And one of the things, we talk about shared cars, for example, as being a panacea about something that will help us in life. But in fact, shared cars create more congestion because shared cars are on the road more time than private cars. Private cars stand still for 10, 15, 20 hours a day. Shared cars are on the road all the time. Buses, surface traffic is on the road. Self-driving cars, that fellow from uh, Uber and uh, all the computer and all that stuff, they're going to be stuck in surface traffic just like everybody else. So while you may have hands free, you're going to be sitting in your traffic. Taxi cabs, electric cars, everyone talks about electric cars being so great. Electric cars are stuck in traffic just like everyone else. I think the collapse of uh, Better Place is a good illustration of that fact. People were concerned about buying a Better Place car because they were afraid of getting stuck in traffic, running down their battery, and then being really stuck. And carpools are stuck in traffic just like everyone else, and that's why you see all the carpool lanes are basically empty. That, of course, leads to pollution. And there are kids in the world, whether it's in China or India or the Philippines, who have not seen a blue sky since the day they were born. And all of you who have traveled to Asia know this to be a fact. And so the question is, what is the solution? Well, some people say, well, let's just build more roads. But every study worldwide shows that the more roads you build, the more traffic you get. And I, these initials up on top are the London School of Economics, MIT, the Property Environment Research Council. Um, every organization worldwide has demonstrated this. This is really not open for debate. Vehicles kilometer traveled rises in direct proportion to the available lanes of kilometer roadway, which basically means <coughs> if you build it, they will come. <coughs> And we've seen this, you know, you try and build a new road and before you know, you get this mess and that's what we're seeing unfortunately in Israel and we're seeing it worldwide. Um, so the solution, well, what we say is we need a system that's really fast, just like a bullet train, is economical like an electric car, um, can operate like a self-driving car or an elevator, is uh, free from traffic and is above traffic and um, this is what it looks like. It's called Skytran. And this is a real vehicle. It's at NASA Ames Research Center. It's uh, flying transportation that goes above the traffic and travel at speeds of up to 150 miles an hour. Energy efficient, non-polluting, never stops unless it's your station. It uh, has a very small footprint, meaning we don't have to tear up roads, we don't have to dig tunnels, we don't have to close and take over traffic lanes for bus rapid transit and, and stuff like that. And uh, it can be built on site, just like Lego. I've got a short little video here. If you would please play it for me. So this is an illustration of how a SkyTran system is rolled out. You don't have to close the street because we're supported by 18-inch diameter poles. Um, the vehicles travel on this guideway, which is rolled out like Lego, connected like Lego on site connected to these lampposts, which can also collect data and provide electricity. Um, the vehicles travel above traffic, above surface traffic, and um, when they stop, they go offline. And what you're seeing here is a station, and you'll see a vehicle come into that station, and when that vehicle goes into the station, all the other vehicles behind it simply pass it by. So there's no stopping on the main line, and that's why you never have to stop unless it's literally at your station. Um, we can move, uh, well this is just an illustration of that. Um, vehicles continue straight, the stations are offline. Because the footprint of the system is so small, the stations can be inside buildings, on top of buildings, underground, uh, wherever there's room, you don't really have to take up and occupy a lot of space for that. The cost of the system is a small fraction of any competing system. Some of you may know that the Jerusalem Light Rail cost $160 million a kilometer. So let's say for the sake of discussion, 60 million went to Olmert, 100 million is still, 100 million per kilometer is still a big number. 
And uh, SkyTran is a small fraction. It's one-tenth to one-twentieth the cost of any competing system. And what's the significance of that? The significance is that finally public transportation does not have to feed off the public trough, meaning that these are profitable systems. They are eagerly financed by private individuals just like any other toll road. And that means that taxpayers are not burdened with the expense of a SkyTran system or public transportation. Um, of course, you're going to see this graph. We excel in all categories. Not surprising. We made the graph. So <laughs> who are we? Well, we're, we're a NASA Ames uh, Research Center company called, we're a Space Act company, which means that NASA is one of our uh, developers and collaborator, collaborators. And we're now working with Israel Aerospace Industries near the airport where we're building our first systems. How does SkyTran work? I'm going to show you a short video with the assistance of one of my colleagues here. <coughs> Do I have sound? I need sound for this video. My colleague, uh, we're based at the NASA Ames Research Center. What he's showing you is he's holding a magnet in his hand. Magnets are invisible force that attract other magnets, uh, attracts other magnets and they attract iron. He's pointing to the top sheet, which is plastic. There's no iron in plastic. And the bottom sheet is aluminum. There is no iron in aluminum. So he's going to drop the magnet, and you'll see what happens from the plastic to the aluminum. OK, we get it. Drop it. <laughs> there we go. So he drops it, and it just falls straight down. Why? Because of gravity. It's going to do it again, drops the magnet, it falls straight down. Now, what's cool about aluminum is although it doesn't have any iron and it's not magnetic, it does conduct electricity because it has something that physicists call loose electrons. And those loose electrons conduct electricity, but on magnets, they also act sometimes like heavy molasses. And you see? The magnet comes to almost a full stop simply by changing the orientation of the magnet. We're going to show it to you again. From the plastic to the aluminum, boom, complete stop. Now, anyone who's been on a roller coaster has experienced this because this is how roller coasters stop. You can go very fast and then boom, you come to an almost immediate stop. Why? Because of this molasses effect. So what did our engineers do? They thought, well, if we can change the orientation of these magnets and put two magnets together, we can fly. And that's what you're seeing here. This is the magic of magnetic flight. This is just like a glider glides on air. Our wings, we call these our magnetic wings, glide along this aluminum. And they're doing it on a magnetic wave that they themselves are actually generating. So no power is required. Now look what happens. We put a SkyTran vehicle on our magnetic wings. And all we have to do is push this vehicle forward or pull it forward and you're going to see what happens. Bingo, flight. And understand that this flight is free. We're not spending any energy to get the flight. And what does the flight get us? Zero friction. And what happens when you remove friction from transportation? Your energy uses drops, drops precipitously. So all we do is we take all of this stuff and we give it a little push. If any of you have played air hockey or ice hockey, you know what happens when you give that puck a little push, boom, it'll go forever. That's how SkyTran is efficient, cost effective, and really the game changer. So how do we get that little push that I spoke about? Apologize for the typo. How do we get that little push? Well, we need something to push it. And what we've done is we've created the first magnetic propeller. And what you're seeing here is a simple motor. This motor, all it knows how to do is to turn around. You can take it off of any fan. But we've taken this motor and we've wrapped it with neodymium magnets. Neodymium magnets are a rare earth material. Rare earth, however, should not confuse you. They're not expensive. They're not rare. That's simply the nomer by which they go by. And uh, we've wrapped this around a motor. Now, any of you who remember high school physics know that when you take a magnet and rotate it to the right, it's going to go forward. And when you take that magnet and rotate it to the left, it's going to want to go backward. So we take this motor and we put it inside a, uh, an aluminum cylinder, and we use very, in, very little energy to m rotate it, and you'll see what happens. I have another video here. What we've done here is the, the aluminum cylinder is loose and the motor is moving, but you'll understand, you'll get the picture. up the drive system. 
Will we get uh, regenerative braking? So what you're seeing is how this ah, how intriguing. John smiling. Okay. Now, <laughs> if the aluminum cylinder were fixed and the magnet rotating, which is just something we can't show you because it would go forward and you wouldn't see it, um, the magnet rotates. The magnet is rushing forward inside this aluminum cylinder, and as it's rushing forward, it's dragging the vehicle with the vehicle's magnetic wings. And what you're seeing here is one of our engineers hold the magnetic wings. So. The magnetic wings attached to the vehicle, the motors attached to the vehicle, the motor starts to turn, the wings tilt upwards just like an airplane, and the whole thing takes off and it flies and now you have no friction and the energy use is, is really de minimis. So where does all this stuff go? It goes inside what we call aluminum reaction rails. This is basically the entire footprint we need. This is supported on a steel pole, 18 inch diameter, and bingo, you have your SkyTran system. This is what it would look like in a residential district. Just take a look here. You have all these wires, all these poles. And uh, once we build our system, the wires disappear because they go inside the guideway. The poles clean up the environment. You can reduce traffic and um, have a very different uh, opportunity. So we are keeping the planet blue. I have a few more minutes left. I'll be glad to take questions, if that's OK. Um, well, the first system has been built at Israel Aerospace Industries. It's now there. If you go up Route 44, you can see it on the east side. Um, it's what we call an engineering test bed, which means that we built the system on the surface, on the ground, so that the engineers can have easy access. They put a lot of computers to, to get data equipment. And we're now developing systems for cities around the world. In Israel, we, we're developing systems in Herzliya, Netanya, uh, Tel Aviv, Rishon LeZion. So we have a number of cities that have lined up to get this system. Uh, and worldwide, we're doing this in France, in the United States, in India, of course, in uh, China. So a lot of demand for systems. I think the first commercial systems will probably be up two years from now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're all for, all, we're all for sabotage because we will find the stupidest suicide bomber to blow himself up in a single person vehicle. You really, so that's, you know, that's uh, the Darwin law. Let's get rid of all the stupid suicide bombers. We only want smart suicide bombers. We, we have great redundancy on the system. You'd have to take out quite a few poles at the same time uh, in order to have anything happen. And even if something did happen, all you'd have is a sag or a collapse of the system but the vehicles can stop on a dime, literally, because what they do is they use what's called an eddy brake. They drop a piece of um, aluminum into this guideway, and that disrupts the magnetic wave, and it, and it just lands immediately and stops. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that the single lane will always support the demand, or you will have to think of scaling the number of lanes? Right, so the system is designed as a network. It's not designed to be a single lane system. And um, because the costs are so low, remember, I can build 20 lines for the cost of one light rail line. So once the system expands to a network, first of all, the revenues jump, but the usability jumps because now it's getting closer and closer to where you are. Today, if you're in, um, you know, if you're in the Namal in Tel Aviv and you want to get to Herzliya, what you have to do is you have to find a way to get from the Namal to the train station. That's going to take you 40 minutes, and then you won't find parking at the train station. So you're going to you know, take you another 15, 20 minutes. Then you're going to get on the train. You have to wait for the train schedule. The train will take you then to the Erzliya train station. You'll get off, but then you have to come here. So you're basically wasting an hour and a half to do a decent commute from that location. With SkyTrain, you'll be able to get on there and get to Erzliya in six minutes. Just imagine what that does to the socioeconomic problems in Israel that, you know, we had the demonstrations on Rothschild Boulevard. What are those demonstrations about? They're basically about the cost of housing in Tel Aviv because no one wants to be stuck in traffic for two hours or three hours every day. If you can live on the beach in Ashkelon and get to Tel Aviv in 10 minutes, that, that completely changes the dynamic. That will lower that cost of housing. This can go up to 250 kilometers an hour. So inside the urban environment, it'll go 35, 45 kilometers an hour, which is very, very fast inside a city because you're never stopping. 
And then once you get out of the city on your way to Herzliya or Cholon or Ramat Sharon, it'll kick up to highway speeds, but uninterrupted highway speeds, meaning you're, you're not slowing down for traffic. But, but, but potentially it could be a traffic jam. It can't be a traffic jam because... It's speed, you cannot get in the line and you cannot jump in. The beauty of the system is that as you get to 50, 60 percent capacity, it is economically compelling to build another line. So it's, it's almost a, a uh, perpetual motion machine because you, you continue to make more money. Now you're connecting more and more communities. The cost of the system is very low. It's easily financeable by banks, bonds, and so forth. And we have quite a few financial groups, including here, Banca Poalim, that are eager to fund these systems. So that's never going to be a problem. Yes, ma'am. Well, we hope so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and the second is, what about the contract transporting people? What about transportation of everything else? Well, we can move, so we can move um, cargo. The system, as you've seen it, is limited by weight. Now, we can go to greater weights, and we can actually carry pallets of heavy cargo, but then the infrastructure changes. So we have two different system designs. Um, if one, somebody wanted to have a system that could, you know, took pallets from a plane or, or a ship, we could have that system. But the system is designed for people, um, wheelchairs, bicycles, and uh, packages like FedEx size packages. Yeah. The vehicles are, are designed for two people. Um, we expect that they will be used by one person. Uh, because if you look at the people on the road, it's basically 1.1 pe pe people per car. And that's true around the world. People don't like to share, they don't like to carpool, they like their privacy. And our target market are people in their cars. So we're trying to get people out of their cars. Got uh, time for one question? Yeah. We avoid traffic jams in the station in a number of ways. We, the stations can be configured in any fashion because they're modular, they're built like Lego. So if we start and we have one, you know, a, a simple linear station and the demand starts to grow, we can now build a parallel station in the same footprint of the station so you're just not stuck. And the vehicles go forward and backwards. Remember I told you, you turn it to the right, it'll go forward, turn it to the left, it'll go backwards. So the vehicles will go forward and backward. And, um, for example, at a stadium, you know, where you have 100,000 people and you want to clear it, so what we do is we go in and we call it an octopus configuration. So you have a couple of lines that go in and then they stop at each gate at the stadium and it goes eight levels up. And we can, you know, probably get 30 to 35 percent of the stadium emptied within 15 minutes. Now, if you compare that to waste stadiums, empty today, it's two hours to get out of a stadium, a 100,000 person stadium, because you have to go around, you know, get up to the top, then walk out, go down the steps, get to your car, get in the car, uh, try and get out of the parking lot, big deal. I, I, one more question, yeah. Yeah, it's like an elevator. You go into an elevator, you push a button, and, and you're gone. That's exactly the way SkyTrain is. The passenger is passive. The passenger doesn't control speed. And it, all the passenger controls is destination. And usually the vehicle will know where that person is going before the person gets into the vehicle. Because the vehicle will not allow you in unless it recognizes you. And once it recognizes you, it knows your travel pattern. So it will actually prompt you and say, are you going to Azrieli Center? And if you say yes, it'll take you off. If not, it'll prompt you for something else. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.